thanks, this is Lisa. And um, it's really fun to present this. It's been, uh, we've been working on this for a little while and um, this project FitWit uh, looks to answer the question of can exercise improve cognitive performance? And Jeremy's gonna get into uh, a deeper dive into what that means and how we measure that. Um, but this whole thing, a lot of this started um, if we could go to the next, Jeremy's manning this, with um, some work that um, uh, Dave Bucci was doing from Psychology and Brain Sciences. And um, after Dave's death, we took this over. Uh, Jeremy and I became the co-PIs for this grant uh, that was through CTBH and the pilot grant. Um, and we've also been helped by Emily Glasser, um, and the Dolly Lab staff and students. So this is a, a group project that um, has a lot of care. We've put a lot of care and a lot of thought into it. So I'm glad to be able to share it. So I'll talk at the end about the app itself and some of the concepts that went into making it the way that we did. Cool. Yeah, so I'll, I'll dig a bit into the kind of science side of it. Um, yeah, so it's it's uh, a pleasure to be speaking with your group today. And uh, I'm also excited to tell you about our progress that uh, was made possible in part by pilot funding from the uh, Center for Technology and Behavioral Health. Um, at, it, at its heart, our, our project is about discovering links between physical and mental health. Um, and as Lori mentioned, this project began as a collaboration between my lab and Lori's Dolly Lab and Dave Bucci um, with guidance and support from Emily Glasser. And then after Dave's passing, Lori, Emily, and I have kind of carried the project forward. So the, the most obvious and direct benefit of physical exercise is that it can strengthen our muscles and endurance and like improve the strength and efficiency of our hearts and lungs and increase our bone density and so on. So in other words, like exercise makes our bodies stronger. Um, and then the physical benefits of exercise can be explained primarily by stress responses of the affected body tissues. So for example, like when skeletal muscles are taxed during exercise, uh, you know, during exercise, that causes micro tears in the muscle fibers. And then our bodies respond by repairing the muscle fibers and making them larger. But then indirectly, exercise can also affect our minds and brains. So for example, you know, you might have experienced that you feel good for the rest of the day when you go for a run or that you can focus a bit better or feel less stressed out after you've gone for a walk. And essentially there are two main aspects of mental function that can benefit from exercise. So first exercise can affect our mental health. So in addition to that example of feeling good after a run, regular exercise can lead to longer term changes in the brain that affect a wide range of mental health dimensions, including you know, things like depression, anxiety, and even obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. And then second, physical exercise can affect our cognitive performance. So exercise can affect how clearly and efficiently we think in the general sense, but it can also affect specific cognitive functions like perception, attention, memory, and cognitive control. The mechanisms underlying how physical exercise affects mental fitness are not as well understood as the mechanisms that affect how exercise affects physical fitness, but we do have you know, some ideas about how it might work. So we know that physical exercise leads to a wide variety of physiological changes in the body. And those include you know, the changes to muscle fibers that I mentioned, but also changes in energy storage and hormone release and so on. And hormone release in particular can affect the brain in a few ways. Um, so for example, you know, hormones can affect the mix and quantity of neurotransmitters that are distributed throughout the brain. They can affect how brain cells grow and connect or communicate with each other and how different proteins are expressed across different cells and, and so on. 
And these changes seem to depend both on the specific blend of hormones that are released and also the concentration or amount of release. And then during different types of exercises, like aerobic versus anaerobic exercise or like high intensity interval training versus endurance training, uh, et cetera, each type of exercise evokes different, you know, its own special physiological response. And then one idea is that these different physiological responses um, that are each brought about by a particular exercise or fitness activity could lead to different sorts of changes or responses in our brains. And then meanwhile, we also know from decades of cognitive neuroscience research that different cognitive functions seem to be supported by different, albeit often overlapping, networks of brain structures. And some more recent work also suggests that different aspects of mental health might also affect brain structures and connectivity patterns in kind of unique ways. So taken together, it suggests some exciting possibilities. So imagine that we have some mental target in mind, like getting an A on an upcoming exam or feeling happier or improving your ability to focus at work. That mental target is gonna be associated in turn with some target set of brain structures or mechanisms. And we think that different exercises will affect any given set of brain structures or mechanisms differently which in turn implies that different exercises might have unique effects on different aspects of mental health or cognitive performance. So we could rank a set of candidate exercises according to each activity's expected influence on the given mental goal or target. And then after you know, entering your mental target into your smartphone, our recommendation system app could then you know, send you periodic reminders about when and how to exercise. And then you could even imagine eventually linking those reminders with your personal and professional calendars so that the system can learn like when you're most likely to engage in exercise and or have the time in your schedule to do so. So just like a couch to 5K training app might recommend a schedule of exercises to get your legs and heart and lungs into sufficiently good shape to run a 5K, our recommendation system would propose an analogous schedule of exercises that would be chosen to optimize your mental fitness along the dimensions you chose to prioritize. So to build and train the system, we need to know about three broad categories of information about our users. First, we need to know about their physical health attributes like their you know, general fitness level, resting heart rate, baseline activity levels, exercise habits, and, and that sort of thing. Second, we uh, want to know about each user's mental health along a variety of dimensions. So for example, if someone is depressed or at risk for depression, we'd want to be able to factor that into our recommendations. And then third, we need some way of tracking or evaluating each user's cognitive performance. So for example, we'd want to know something about the user's current performance profiles so that we could factor that into our recommendations as well. For each of these categories of information about a given person, you can imagine taking a set of measurements that in aggregate tell us something useful. So I've given the example of characterizing physical health using attributes like someone's resting heart rate or baseline activity levels and, and so on. And you can think about taking a whole bunch of these sorts of measurements and storing them as a set of numbers. So in other words, the, uh, the set of numbers for one person would describe you know, whatever aspects of their physical activity we identified as being, or sorry, their physical fitness that we identified as being relevant or useful. So from a geometric perspective, if you wanna picture it, um, you could think of each user's measurements as a point in a feature space. So it can be helpful to understand how this works in three dimensions. So the 3D space I'm showing here has three axes, which you know, we could label as X, Y, and Z. Maybe X corresponds to something like resting heart rate, and you can imagine Y corresponds to average daily number of steps taken over the past week, and Z corresponds to the number of minutes of high intensity activity someone engaged in yesterday. And then since 
each of these measurements can be represented by a single number, we could represent the set of three numbers as a coordinate in this space. So each person is shown as a black dot, and then the dots that are nearby represent people whose fitness measurements were similar. So in general, we don't have to stop at three dimensions. It's hard to visualize what a higher dimensional space might look like, but the same basic ideas hold. Each dimension corresponds to some measurement, and that allows us to represent each person as a point in our feature space. And then people with similar measurements will be mapped onto nearby points. So, you know, the question becomes, how can we fill in our numbers to flesh out everyone's profiles and, you know, plot them appropriately in these spaces? Um, smart watches and wrist worn fitness trackers continually collect a wide range of useful measurements like heart rate and blood oxygenation and accelerometer data that can in turn be used to infer activity levels and information about exercises. Uh, they track sleep habits and a bunch of more, you know, a bunch more. Um, often this information is also linked with smartphone apps that enable users to input even more fine grain information like specific foods that someone eats or water intake or various body measurements or even things like mood or stress levels. So altogether, activity and fitness trackers provide a really rich source of information that can be mined to build out detailed profiles of each individual's physical fitness. And because most of this information is collected automatically without requiring, you know, ongoing interaction or intervention from the user, we can get a continually evolving and updating picture. And we can represent that snapshot of someone's physical health at a particular time, for example, as a set of numbers. And then we can use that to determine which people's profiles are similar or different. So whereas physical measurements already come in as a set of numbers, you know, we might ask, how, how could we get an analogous representation of something really abstract, like someone's mental health profile? Well, a trick we use is to break down mental health into a set of concrete dimensions. And then each dimension represents a well-defined and well-studied aspect of mental health, like depression, anxiety, psychopathy, schizophrenia, attention deficit disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, autism, and, and so on. Um, so you might think of these dimensions um, that I've mentioned as disorders that you like either have or don't have, but in reality, each of us expresses tendencies or aspects of all of these dimensions. So it's more accurate to think about our mental health as a set of numbers that describe how much we express each mental health dimension. And even though it might be useful to read out one particular number, for example, that you know characterizes our risk of um, developing post-traumatic stress disorder, it's really our complete profile that reflects where we're at. So you can think of it as being analogous to trying to understand someone's fitness by looking at their weight alone versus the full set of their body measurements and fitness activities. So it turns out that estimating how much people express different aspects of mental health is a relatively well-studied problem in psychiatry. So although it's still not perfect by any means, the field of psychiatry has developed a suite of screening surveys that people can fill out themselves. And then by scoring each survey, which can be done automatically, we can estimate where each person falls along a given mental health dimension. And then the high level idea is that we can compare one person's like screening survey responses to the set of responses from a large number of other people to estimate how that new person likely relates to the population. And then once we can re represent the set of mental health dimensions as a set of numbers, we can use each person's numbers to compare and contrast them to other people geometrically. So in other words, each person's mental health profile is like a point in some high dimensional feature space whose dimensions are different aspects of mental health. And it's worth noting that just like a wrist worn fitness tracker can't tell us exactly what someone is doing or exactly what their fitness characteristics are, mental health screening surveys are also very far from exact. But 
we actually don't need them to be exact. We just need to know roughly what each person is like. And then the more things we measure and the more people we measure from, the less any one measurement will end up mattering. Just like fitness and mental health, cognitive performance is also multifaceted. So in everyday conversations, people might you know, refer to other people as, you know, or refer to like how smart someone is. Um, but there's this great Einstein quote that says something like, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. So in other words, we're all good at some things and bad at other things. And if you focus on only one skill or function, then you're gonna miss the bigger picture. Um, so there, there are normed approaches to studying intelligence like IQ tests, but we want to be able to get a finer grained, you know, finer grained insights into cognition. And to do that, we can have someone perform a series of tasks that each test different skill sets or aspects of how they think or perform. And then if we can characterize your performance on each task as a number, then the full set of numbers across all the tasks I have you do will comprise a sort of like cognitive profile that we can use to compare you with other people. So just like fitness and mental health profiles, we can think of someone's cognitive profile as a point in a high dimensional feature space whose dimensions now are different tasks or cognitive functions. So once we can represent fitness and mental health and cognitive performance profiles using these geometric spaces, it opens up some really, really neat possibilities. Essentially, we can start to build mappings between these spaces by figuring out the geometric transformations that move each port person's coordinates in one space to their coordinates in another space. And then those mappings tell us how fitness and mental health and cognitive performance all relate to each other. And then if we know someone's fitness profile, once we have those mappings, it means we can start to predict how they're gonna perform on some specific task or what their mental health might look like. And as we collect more data, we can start to make more and more accurate estimates about the things that we didn't explicitly measure from any given person. And then we can also start to predict what might happen if we can push around someone's coordinates in one of these spaces. So if I can figure out a way to change your fitness profile, then that's going to correspond to changes in cognitive performance and mental health too. So to get this whole thing going, we need to start somewhere. And we decided to focus in on a subset of the things that we could measure about physical, mental, and cognitive health. So for example, rather than trying to get at every possible aspect of cognition, we tried to think about a subset of cognitive function that seemed to provide a good balance between, on the one hand, being able to zoom in on specific functions with, diff with you know, decent granularity, um, but on the other hand, also being able to hopefully generalize to other aspects of cognition. And I see studying memory as one way to achieve that, you know, that balance. So the logic uh, might go something like this. So let's assume that the reason we have brains in the first place is to enable us to behave intelligently. I use that term very loosely. Um, and in our, our brains let us, you know, in the general sense, take in inputs from the external world store information about the world and our past experiences, and then draw on that stored information when we're deciding what to do next. So optimizing how we behave requires forming predictions about how our actions now are likely to affect us in the future. So partly that depends on learning to associate you know, how we behave with how the external world changes. And partly that depends on learning about the rules that govern how our world works so that we can start to make predictions about what situations we might find ourselves in next. And the common thread running through how we learn these associations and how we generate predictions that draw on our past experiences is memory. And, you know, memory, so memory is a, is a, is a major reason why we have brains in the first place and why our brains are of any practical use to us. If we didn't have memory, we'd be, like unchanging stimulus response machines. 
Now, to look at this stuff, we first needed to build up a data set that we could use to estimate fitness and mental health and cognitive performance profiles from a bunch of people. So we started off by recruiting uh, a little over 100 participants using the online uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk platform. And uh, in order to participate in our study, we required people to have owned and utilized a fitness tracker for at least one year prior to enrolling in the study. And then we also asked participants to give us anonymized access to their fitness tracking data from the prior year. Once we had their fitness data in hand, we asked each person to self-report on a variety of aspects of mental, their mental health, and then we had them engage in a series of memory tasks. We had people do four sets of tasks that each tested a different aspect of their memory. And most of the tasks also had a short-term and long-term components so that we could look at effects at different time scales. The first thing we had people do is a very well-studied list learning paradigm called free recall. And the idea is that people study lists of randomly chosen words, you know, one word at a time mm -hmm. flashed on their screen. And then after the last word on the list disappears from the screen, they type in any words they remember studying in whatever order they come to mind. And then we can use you know, the overall proportion of words people remembered, and then also um, some you know, aspects of the orders in which the words are recalled to gain insights into how this particular aspect of memory works. Um, and in, in, in the memory world, people think of this paradigm as drawing on what's called episodic memory or memory for specific events. And the, the idea is you can think of the act of studying each word as a little event in your life. Um, but then importantly, because each of the words or the events, so to speak, are randomly chosen and randomly ordered, there's no deeper structure that connects the words to each other. So it's kind of you know, memory for events in its pure, purest form. So we had people study and recall a few lists early on in the experiment. And then after they'd done some of the other tasks, we asked them to think back to those lists and retype out any words they remembered. The next task we had people do is also considered to be an episodic memory task. Um, we had people watch a short video clip of a story, and then we tested their memory by asking them to write out a narrative of what had happened in the story. We also had them answer a bunch of multiple choice questions about the story. Um, so, so whereas the random word list task looked at memory for unstructured information, this story memory test, uh, the story memory task tests people's memories for structured information. So you can think, can think of the story also as a sequence of events, but since each event draws meaning from other events in the story, and since the order that things happen in the story also carry meaning, the way people experience the story has an important structure with, with respect to you know, how it unfolds in time. And then just like for the list learning task, we tested people's memory on a short time scale by testing them right after they finished watching the video clip, and then later on in the experiment by having them retype out whatever they remembered of the narrative later on in the experiment. The third task we had people engage in was a foreign language flashcards task. So we showed people a series of like flashcards um, with pairs of English and Gaelic words. And then we, we chose those particular languages because part of our screening procedure ensured that all of the participants in studies in our study were both fluent and in English and not at all familiar with Gaelic, which is a you know, rarely spoken language. Um, and then we tested people's memories using a series of multiple choice questions. Um, participants got one test right after studying the flashcards and then a second test later on in the experiment. So this task draws on what's called associative and semantic memory. Um, associative memory refers to our ability to link or connect different thoughts or ideas. And semantic memory refers to memory for facts or information um, that aren't specific to any one moment in time. And then uh, finally, we had people do a really frustrating, at least when I do it, location learning task. Um, and 
what happens in, in this task is we randomly position some shapes on the computer screen, and then we blank the screen and ask people to move each shape back to its original position. And then we made this uh, the test in this task progressively harder by asking people to remember or to memorize the locations of greater and greater numbers of shapes. And the key thing we wanted to know was people's baseline performance on like a version of the task with just two shapes, which is relatively easy. And then we wanted to know also how quickly their memory performance degrade, uh, degraded as we added more shapes. So this uh, task draws on the same aspects of memory that you use to remember like you know, locations, like where you parked your car or where you put your keys and, and that sort of thing. We discovered quite a lot of interesting stuff, which we wrote up in a paper that's currently making its way through the peer review pipeline. Um, so you can check out that paper, which is on my lab website for the juicy details. But I wanted to highlight a few examples to give you a sense of like how we're thinking about the data. So the plots I'm showing here are about how performance on each of those memory tasks uh, relates to people's overall activity levels. And you can think of people's performance on each task as a single number. And here I'm highlighting people's daily step counts to show one aspect of their overall activity levels. So these are like timelines of how many steps you took each day. Over the year leading up to these memory tests, everyone has you know, different step counts and people's step counts change over time. The black lines in each of these plots show the average step counts from each day across everyone in the study. But then we can also start to examine potential interactions between physical activity and different aspects of memory by taking weighted averages. So each participant in our study contributes one task performance score for each task. And we can also split out the short-term tests on the left and the long-term tests on the right in case there are interesting timing differences. But then for a particular task, we can look at the activity histories of people who performed particularly well on that task. And those people get upweighted in the average for that task. Then we can also look at the activity histories of people who performed you know, relatively poorly on the task and they would get downweighted in their you know, respective weighted average. So each colored line in these plots shows the weighted average history of step counts for some task. And when one color differs from the black baseline curve, that means that people who performed particularly well on that task tended to have higher or lower step counts. There's a lot going on here, but one pattern that I think you can see clearly is that people who took more steps tended to have worse memory for associations, shown in orange, but better memory for events, shown in blue and green. And you can see those differences emerge even a full year before the participants even knew about our study, which is pretty surprising. You can use a similar trick to look at potential associations between fitness activity and different aspects of mental health. For example, in this plot, the black curve again shows people's average history of step counts as a baseline. But then the pink and purple curves are weighted according to people's self-reported typical and current stress levels. You can see that people who reported higher levels of stress tended to be more active as measured by their step counts. So this data set is really interesting and there's, there are a ton of venues to explore and we've really only touched the tip of the iceberg so far. But one area that this experiment couldn't tell us about is causality. So for example, on the previous slide, I showed you that people who were more stressed out tended to be more active. But like, does that mean activity causes stress? Or is, that, is it that people who are stressed out also tend to have lifestyles that require them to move around more? Or maybe stressed out people who own fitness trackers like to use exercise as a stress reduction tool. And so what we're observing is a reflection of people exercising in response to stress. Or maybe like type A people maybe like many of you, tend to be more stressed, but also more anal about getting in their step counts every day. So what we really want to know, but what we can't know from this data set is something like, you know, if someone were to increase or decrease their activity level, will their stress levels go up or down as a consequence? 
That's the key thing. And then something else we can't really get at with this study uh, is that we really only assess people's men mental fitness once. So in other words, like, you know, we have people come into the experiment and they self-report their mental health information once during the experiment, and then they engage in each task just one time. So we get one snapshot of their mental health and cognitive performance profiles, um, you know, at that moment. But like, what if mental fitness is dynamic? And in fact, in order for our exercise recommendation system to be of use, we really hope that mental fitness isn't fixed. Um, so we need to know how different aspects of mental fitness change over time and how malleable different aspects of mental fitness are, for example, in response to doing different forms of exercise. The key to unlocking insights into causality and dynamics is to find some way of interacting with the user and measuring different aspects of their fitness and mental health and cognitive profiles over time. And um, smartphones are a really convenient way to accomplish this. People you know, are always on their phones and we tend to carry our phones with us nearly everywhere we go. Plus, smartphones and fitness trackers have all sorts of useful sensors that we can draw on to track physical activity. And since smartphones are just little touchscreen computers, they can also be a great platform for participating in experiments. So by manipulating when we notify participants to exercise or engage in specific cognitive tasks, we can start to test out our hypotheses about causality and dynamics. So for example, I might have two participants who show similar baseline performance on some task, but suppose that I ask one of them to exercise and give them the same task a day later, and suppose I have the other participant rest for a day before asking them to re-engage with the task. So now I have a like mini contrast set up that can help us to detangle the impact of exercise or resting. A, uh, a hitch was that my lab didn't have any in-house expertise to actually create smartphone applications. Uh, but Lori can tell you about how her group turned these ideas into a full-fledged mobile sensing platform. Um, so, um, uh, so I, I'll turn it over to Lori in a second. But um, in addition to the fantastic students from Lori's lab, the work I've told you about also benefited uh, you know, either directly or indirectly for many of the students in my lab. Um, and I want to call out in particular Gina Notaro, who has since left my lab for greener pastures, but uh, Gina played a central role in setting up the online experiment. And also Esme Chen and Paxton Fitzpatrick, who have both done a great job helping to mine the data we've collected for, you know, juicy science nuggets. <laughs> so uh, thanks so much for your attention. And uh, let me stop screen sharing and I'll turn things over to Lori. Lori, you're still muted. Can you guys see my desk, my screen? Great. Thanks, Jeremy. That was a great um, explanation of the ideas behind this. And those of you who know me um, have heard me say many times that it's great to have an idea or a great experiment that you want to test, but if you don't have, if you want to do it on a mobile phone and you don't design it in the right way so that people will use the, do the research that you need them to do properly, uh, it can completely nullify all of your all of your findings. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out a way to make this um, a successful application. So in, our goal was to create a, a phone and an Apple Watch application that would support the research that uh, Jeremy and others were doing and to make the participation in it enjoyable so that people would keep doing it, right? It had to be enjoyable and it had to be easy. And it wasn't a simple experiment that people had to go through. They had to go through it every single day. And some days you did one thing and some days you did another. And so it was really a lot of figuring out how to uh, go through that process, get people through it. 
So um, the guiding principles that we were using in order to do that was that we wanted to guide them through the complex tasks to make it simple to follow so that people knew all along the way what they had to do. And we spent a long time working on how, what's the best way to sort of name these different functions that they, that people went through and to get them, cause you have to, you, you exercise and then you have to wait an hour and then you have to do the test within a certain amount of time. And then you have to wait a certain amount of time before you exercise it again. So it's, you know, how do we get people to do that? How do we name it? And then how do we make the memory test something that is gamified in a way that it's, it gives you uh, the gives Jeremy the data that he needs, but is also something that people will complete because they're not easy uh, cognitive tests. And then create a reward system to keep people coming back, right? So you do it once or twice, it's one thing, but we needed a longitudinal study. We needed people to keep doing it on and on. So we created a reward, a reward system. And then we needed to make sure that we were maintaining the experimental validity. That was the underlying thing through all of it, uh, through everything that we did. So we spent a long time uh, working out the look and feel the user experience and the user interface for this application. So it features cheerful designs that put people in kind of a good mood, a cohesive color scheme, hand-drawn icons um, in order to get make it a joy to use. The underlying structure for the app is React Native, uh, so it's compatible with an iPhone 8 and above. It has a um, so it uses secure store so that people can only have to sign in one time at the very beginning of using the app. And then it will continue to remember that user throughout the experiment. And then an integration with the Apple Health Kit in order to track people's exercise routine and be able to let people use the, the Apple Watch. So the game, the, the, the tests, were done, there were three different kinds that people, cognitive tasks that they had to do. So there was foreign frenzy, which was a foreign uh, language memory task. Uh, there was top, top shapes, which is a spatial memory task. And then word whiz, which tests vocabulary and word memory. And so um, each day they, a user didn't know which one of those memory tests they would get, but they would get them and we made them sort of fun and visual. You were dragging and dropping icons and images into the screen. So the way that it worked was we had, we broke it down into different states, right? So there were workout days when a user was expected to actually do a workout. So the way that it would work is they would be prompted to tell them that it was their workout day and that they needed to do a workout. And then once the workout was completed, which we would know because we're tracking their activity on their watch, then they had to wait one hour. So they were told, you know, you have this one hour wait. And then they would, then they had um, the rest of the day, they had to do the memory game, but they had to do it during that day. And, um, and so they would play the memory game and then they would take a recall test. And then state three um, is the memory game is, the, oh, they have a three hour window to do the memory uh, game and then the, it's completed and then they wait until the next day. So the, then they have a lazy day and that's when they only take a recall test but they don't exercise. And then they have to wait until the next day when they start again. There are days when they don't do a workout or don't do the memory game or they don't, complete the recall task. And so those we had to take account for and figure out how to deal with that in terms of the data. And then we had to give people push notifications all along the way to remind them of where they were in the task and what they had to do. So um, in order to keep them coming back to the task, they, we use this kind of these wit coins. So as you did, if you completed a day correctly, you got a wit coin. After you collect enough wit coins, you sort of start leveling up. And if you get to the place where you're royalty, you get an Amazon gift card. So it really encouraged them and motivated them to keep on going day after day so that they could win their reward. And so the Fitwit is too is on the App Store and it's available for download and use. And this is the team. We've worked on this for a lot of terms. Um, and this is the team that put it all together, designing it, developing it, 
since uh, 2019, the summer of 2019, we've been working on this. A lot of back and forth with the lab things, you know, it's not, it's not an, it's one of the, it's, it's a very simple looking at, but it's one of the more complex projects that we've worked on in many ways. So that's, um, that's my piece. I think we're open for questions at this point.